Hey everyone, I'm Jay and I do stuff. For the two of you who actually watch my non-Kirby related content, I made a video years ago going full OCD over color palettes for the original Super Mario Bros. game. At one point, I nonchalantly alluded to this obscure Japanese anime movie. An obscure Japanese movie. I should cover that someday. As of the making of this video, the new Illumination Mario movie is right upon us. Or maybe it's already out, depending on whenever this video is posted. So for such a momentous occasion, I'm seizing the opportunity to finally talk about this oddball piece of Mario history. In 1986, one year after the release of the first Super Mario Bros. game, Grouper Studios, in cooperation with Nintendo, released an animated movie based on said game. Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Save Princess Peach was released theatrically and soon on VHS for rent. This was only released in Japan, by the way. The movie was never released anywhere overseas. My only guess is that Mario wasn't as big of a household name in the States at the time, but then again I can't say for certain as I'm only a 90s kid. This isn't necessarily going to be a review of the movie, but rather I'll be playing analysis over most of every aspect of this film. As stated before, the movie was made only a year after the release of the original Super Mario Bros. on the Famicom. Despite that, the movie has a lot of things not found in the original game. A lot of which ranging from strangely abstract, to eerily similar to future Mario games that weren't even a thought at the time. Granted, you could easily chalk these up to sheer coincidence, and you'd probably be right in saying so. But where's the fun in that? So join me as I dissect the many conspiracies of this forgotten Mario movie. The movie starts out with Mario playing the original Famicom. This isn't really any kind of future reference, but it is a neat little easter egg, albeit a bit meta. Seconds later, Mario realizes he's now playing as Princess Peach as she and a bunch of other Bowser's troops leap off the TV in a fairly cliché manner. It's love at first sight as Mario and Peach get acquainted just before Bowser comes, defeats Mario effortlessly, and takes Peach back into the TV world. Mario then finds this pendant Peach seemingly dropped as he falls asleep standing up, I guess? As the screen fades to black and the intro credits start to play. The credits in question are a series of these old-fashioned looking still images as this upbeat 80s rock song plays called Doki Doki Do It. The song itself is nice, even if the title reminds me of Doki Doki Panic, i.e. the game that would eventually become the US version of Super Mario Bros. 2. The movie then cuts to the next day where we see that the Mario Brothers aren't plumbers, but rather they run a grocery store in a town in a desert? Now, this setting is already pretty strange even for Mario standards, but yet, doesn't this sort of look familiar? A small town located in a desert with cacti. It's pretty much Toast Arena from Mario Odyssey. Before Mario Odyssey. Get ready to hear this sound a lot throughout this video, by the way. You have been warned. Anyways, Luigi notices Mario still looking at that pendant from last night. He completely lights up due to the pendant apparently being this mystical treasure from a place called the Mushroom Kingdom. Keep a note on Luigi, by the way. Mario then tries calling... Who knows at this point, as he never clarifies who he's calling. Said caller tells Mario he'll send someone to pick up the bros and then go from there. Just then, this weird-looking blue dog barges into the shop and takes off running with Mario's pendant for which Mario then gives chase. Speaking of the dog, what kind of dog is this? With its big nose and body made out of circles? It looks just like a wiggler who wouldn't go on to appear until Super Mario World. The 
The Burroughs chase the Wiggler Dog throughout the barren wastelands of the desert until they come across a bunch of pipes. They all enter this super tall pipe as the rest of the pipes yeet out of existence. What follows is a kind of trippy sequence of Mara and Luigi flying through this magical void, presumably to the Mushroom Kingdom. Now, this indication of the Mushroom Kingdom being a whole separate world is pretty much exactly what was established as canon for Mario in the US around the time, so it's very interesting how this aspect was acknowledged by the Japanese side of things. Actually, this sequence here specifically really looks like the same transitional scene from the upcoming Illumination movie. The bros finally end up in this secret cave area where they meet this big sage guy who kinda looks like Gandalf who I will be referring to as. I've never seen The Lord of the Rings, by the way. He basically gives a big exposition dump about why the bros are here. Bowser has taken the princess and turned the toads into blocks like in the original game, but he also says Bowser plans on marrying Peach specifically on Friday the 13th under the full moon. He then explains an alleged prophecy about a mustached man finding the three power-ups to defeat Bowser. We now have a two-for-one deal here, as the plot point of Bowser marrying Peach involving the moon wouldn't be until Super Mario Odyssey. On top of that, the whole prophecy of Mario being Bowser is something that would also be brought up in Yoshi's Island. Makes you think. Hearing about Bowser's plan makes Mario so upset that he briefly breaks character stereotype and dons a sombrero in a whole Mexican getup. Again, something that wouldn't reach the games until Odyssey. Luigi, however, doesn't seem concerned about that, as he appears to only care about being rewarded with treasure. Now to take a step back. Throughout this whole flick, Luigi is constantly obsessed with finding treasure and gold rather than rescuing Peach. On top of that, Luigi doesn't have a speck of green on his body. Only yellow outside the obvious blue overalls. Is this really Luigi? After the first of many transitional montages, the bros get into a horde of hallucinogenic mushrooms before being taken by a giant paracoupa to feed her nest of baby birds. No, I am not making this up. Anyways, Mario then spots a crystallized mushroom above the nest, plucks it out of the cliffside, and coins spew out. Falling back onto the field of mushrooms, all the coins turn into toads. The crystallized mushroom specifically turns into a distinctly pink female toad. That's oddly specific. Toadette thanks Mario and hands him the first piece of the Triforce. I guess. The Super Mushroom. After that is another montage, this time featuring the likes of a giant Koopa Troopa crushing the crew, only to be thwarted by a giant Mario. Look at him, he becomes as tall as a skyscraper. So now we have giant enemies from Mario 3's Giant Land and Mega Mario from the original New Super Mario Bros. That makes about 10 of these future references, or whatever you want to call them and we're not even halfway through the movie yet. After said montage, they end up at a fork in the road. A tall sign stems out from a big boot in the ground. They even get directions from a couple of Goombas inside. It's literally the Goomba shoe from Mario 3. The Goombas lead them into a huge garden filled with piranha plants. The bros are soon ambushed by the plants, who seem more like the bigger, longer vine variants from Mario 3D World. They quickly escape, but then encounter Lakitu, who appears to own the garden of the plants they took down. The Lakitu then throws a bunch of spiny eggs around the Mario Brothers, and then proceeds to water them, then expose them to sunlight? Are spinies turtle-like creatures, or plants? After being chased by the newborn Spinies, Mario gets boofed in the bum by a conveniently placed beanstalk. Mario then quite literally snags a ride off of Lakitu's cloud and proceeds to disable the Spinies with... snow. By the way, Mario riding Lakitu's cloud wouldn't actually become a thing until Super Mario World.
As the hibernating spinies turn to flowers? Don't ask. The cloud then turns into... another toadette? Who gives Maro the fire flower, as another montage ensues. That was anticlimactic. Now this montage is where things start to get really warped. Firstly, Maru uses his newly acquired fire flower to shoot fireballs at some buzzy beetle enemies. And it works. Also, I don't remember there ever being an instant ramen power-up in any of the games. Just give them time. After that blatant product placement, Mario and Co. are led into a cave by a trail of coins. But it's a trap, as the Goombas block off the exit, taunt Mario about Bowser marrying Peach, and then leave them with a proto-Sledge brother standing guard. Meanwhile, at Bowser's castle, Peach tries tricking Bowser into using his apparent shape-shifting powers. Okay. Having him turn into a small plush that she locks away in a chest. Only for the chest to turn into Bowser? This truly is a nightmare. Bowser also apparently catches wind of the Mara brothers being captured and forwards it to Peach to her dismay. After that little segue back in the caves, Mario fantasizes about being with Peach while this song called Adieu My Love plays. It's a pretty sweet and sentimental 80s sounding song. It kinda sounds too sappy to be in a movie based on a video game, but I digress. As that's happening, Luigi ends up digging a tunnel out and they make their escape just barely getting nicked by the sledge bro. After that, Luigi dumps his trunk of gold that had turned into rocks. As the rocks fall in the ocean, Mario notices the Starman as he and the Wiggler Dog take a dive. Undersea, Mario and the Wiggler Dog search the depths as they run into a giant anglerfish enemy. Has there ever been an angler enemy in Mario? And are then chased by what seems to be a manta ray at first, but then quickly inflates into a big cheap cheap enemy that soon explodes into a bunch of miniature cheap cheeps. This is pretty much like the big Bertha enemy in Mario 3 who constantly eats and regurgitates their young. Finally, they find the Starman inside a clam enemy who wouldn't make another appearance until New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Or Super Mario 64, but those ones don't have faces. In order to reclaim the Starman, Mario and the Wiggler Dog do... That. But they are victorious, however, as Mario now has all three pieces of the Triforce. I guess. Big Bertha returns, however, as it gives chase until Mario and co. hide in a sunken ship that starts to rise. But not before they're attacked by what I assume to be some kind of gooper blooper from Super Mario Sunshine, as it's both way too big and its tentacles are way too long to be a regular blooper. They escape surprisingly easily as the ship emerges from the ocean and into the sky. Okay, this is way too uncanny just to be coincidence. This is literally an airship from Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World if you count the sunken ship level. They sail away while another song called Crystal Ball plays. I really do like the music in this movie. It has this distinct Japanese 80s charm to it. They soon arrive at Bowser's castle as the big 3-up moon from Super Mario World turns into the blood moon for Breath of the Wild. Meanwhile, inside the castle, the Coopers are setting up Bowser's wedding, which looks more like some kind of spiritual ritual. It's probably a culture thing, so I really shouldn't make any remarks. The Goombas come to tell Bowser how they trapped the Mario Brothers in a cave. Wait, didn't you already know that a few minutes back? Peach comes in as this Koopa priest, I guess, also appears. This is probably a stretch, but I personally get eerie mage vibes from this Koopa. I could see him being interchanged with the Magic Koopa Kamek. Just as they're saying their I-do's, Mario and co. log in as their airship crashes into the castle. 
Now that's how you make an entrance. Bowser flies the coop with the princess in tow. Mario then takes a shortcut in a series of 2D platforming rooms. During the first section, the animation budget runs out as Mario moves at a stunning one frame per second. Next, Mario and the Wiggler Dog traverse through some giant gears. Now this is literally like the castles from the new Super Mario Bros. games. After that, they come across a giant fire pit where the Goombas from before mess around with the platforms with some machine. I just noticed the Goombas have tiny little arms here. What cursed imagery. Meanwhile, while doing his only shtick in the movie, Luigi hits the castle's water system as a big flood breaks out. The flood douses the fire as the pit becomes a big hot tub. But soon after, the castle begins to crumble. Bowser still persists on marriage as he gives Peach a huge ring she could never realistically wear on her finger. Actually, this is just like in Mario Odyssey where Bowser steals the giant ring from Toasterina. They can't keep getting away with this. The castle finally caves in as Mario finds Peach. But obviously it's not that easy as a giant-sized Bowser emerges. Something we'd see plenty more of in subsequent games, giving chase to Mario. Wiggler Dog advises Mario to consume the trifle or er, the three power-ups he's collected. But before Mario can down the last Starman, Sudden Product Placement! This gives Bowser the opportunity to stomp Mario as he loses hold of the Starman. But it's okay as Luigi appears after conveniently finding said Starman. Luigi reluctantly feeds the star to Mario as they are both stomped by Bowser. But then Mario arises and throws Bowser off balance as he drops Peach, which Mario conveniently catches her instantly. Mario then goes Super Saiyan, er, something, as he goes completely ham on Bowser, finishing him off by swinging him by the tail and tossing him into a presumably faraway bomb like in Super Mario 64. A full decade beforehand, mind you. Bowser just gives up as the destroyed rubble turns into flowers. What is this, Sonic CD? Mario then remembers the forgotten plot device and returns the amulet to Peach. Peach then kisses Mario, which is something that wouldn't happen in the games until Super Mario World. I know, I was shocked myself coming to this realization. Apparently, there's two of this amulet that's supposed to be worn by two people who are destined soulmates. Allegedly, it was also given to Peach as a baby before her mother died. How stock can you get? Oh well, lore is lore. This intrigues Mario as he is determined to find this fabled other amulet to be with Peach. But just then, Peach's amulet begins to glow as the Wiggler Dog, remember him, starts to react. Wiggler Dog then turns into the Prince Haru from the neighboring Flower Kingdom. So is he like some alternate take on Princess Daisy then, or what? Haru proceeds to explain that he and Peach were always destined to be married. Don't you just love arranged marriages? Apparently, when Bowser took Peach, he also turned Haru into the Wiggler Dog. However, Mario takes no guff from this as he socks Haru down. Haru then gets up and transforms into some demon-looking thing from Final Fantasy and... Oh, whoops, wrong ending. Mario is then devastated, yet plays along with it as it's really out of his and pretty much everyone else's control. What a trooper. As peace is restored, the Mario brothers take their leave. Peach appears to be a little unsure, but Mario reassures her that he and everyone have pretty much accepted their fate. It all ends as the bros head back to Toast Arena while Haru lives happily ever after with Peach. Prince Haru wins by doing... Effectively nothing. Oh yeah, and Gandalf appears at the very last minute to remind us that he still exists. Woo. 
Also, this film has a post credit sequence where you can see Bowser and his troops working at Mario's grocery store. I guess even he realized that you always win when you are good. But with that, this has been the original Super Mario Bros. movie. This thing was a wild ride to sit through and analyze, let me tell ya. The movie was made at an early time when there wasn't really much of anything to go off of in terms of Mario's source material. Despite that, however, the movie contains lots of things and ideas that wouldn't appear until future Mario games years after. It's pretty nuts how many of them there are. As for the movie on its own merits, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it's this bad, horribly aged cash grab like I'm some sort of judgmental elitist. But at the same time though, I'm not gonna act like this is some slept on diamond in the rust. The movie is very weird with awkward pacing, loose continuity, and less than stellar animation, even for a 1980s anime movie. That being said, I still find it a very fascinating watch. For a super early adaptation of the original game, it manages to set up a unique yet rough interpretation of the characters and world. Some stuff in this would never be seen or mentioned again. Others like these conspiracies would go on to help form some of the most iconic things from future entries, coincidence or not. It seriously wouldn't surprise me if things like the airship and Luigi's Wario characteristics were at least partly inspired by this forgotten film. That being said, I'm super curious to see if anything the new Illumination Mario movie introduces will make it into future games, like the new Fire Donkey Kong. It's completely possible seeing how close Nintendo is with this movie's production, but then again, you can never truly predict Nintendo. Were there any other pre dated aspects from this anime movie I missed? Probably. Let me know in the comments. With that, I'm done here. See ya! Thank you for watching the video. If you'd like to be notified about when I upload a new video, click that subscribe button and also click the little bell icon next to it. I'd love to show my video projects to as many people as I can.